Um, yeah, so welcome everybody uh, to this week's Landscapes Live meeting. My name is Steffi Tofelde and I'm going to convene this seminar today with uh, Michal Ben Israel. And I'm very happy to introduce our today's speaker, Sergi Moon. So Sergi will give a, a seminar for about 40 to 50 minutes. And afterwards, we will have time for questions and discussion. So we will activate the chat towards the end of the seminar, and you will also be able to raise your hand and you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly if you want to. So Sergi, before I hand over to you, I will very briefly introduce you. Um, Sergi did a bachelor and master degree at, uh, at the university um, or at the Seoul National University in South Korea. And after that, she moved to the US where she did her PhD at Stanford University under the supervision of George Hilly and Paige Chamberlain. From there, she did a, or she moved for a postdoc to MIT for two years. And since 2015, she has, or yeah, she holds an assistant professor position at uh, University of California in Los Angeles at the Department of Earth, Planetary and Space Science. So today, Sergi is going to talk about topographic stress influence on fractures, surface processes, and landscape evolution. And with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Sergi. And um, yeah, we're going to look forward to, or we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for nice introductions. And I'm, I'm, uh, I enjoyed the last series of the talks a lot. And um, this is great um, to me to present, had a chance to talk about my research today. As Steffi to, um, mentioned, today I'll talk about topographic stress influences on bedrock fractures and surface processes and landscape evolution. In the, here's the outline of my today's talk. So first I'll talk about what is topographic stress and why it's important. And then a second, I'll present the two recent studies that, um, that I did to trying to answer questions related on stresses, fractures and surface processes. And the last part, I'll discuss some lessons that I learned from the previous research and how we try to move forward in the future. As you can see in this photo that I took from a giant landslide from Eastern Himalaya, fractures, these rocks are really deformed. You can see on the bottom of the bedrock and it's deformed and it, when you move toward the surface, they start to weather. You can see some yellowish color here and then eventually became a soil on the top. And you can see a lot of weathering is going on and the fractures promote weathering and further disintegrated rock mass so it can shed a lot of sediments to rivers. Previous studies of Peter Mona pointed out that the active, active fault can act as a rock crusher. So the bending of a fault can accommodate the strain and they can generate a lot of fractures near fault zone. And the fault zone in the fault zone, if there is a lot of fractures and if, if they can impact the yieldabilities, Roy et al. 2015 paper shows that it can induce some changes on landscape evolution and ch channel evolution. Fractures will cause rapid incision of valleys and easy transport of sediments and rapid erosion of hill slope. So in this uh, model simulation, you can see 60 times and two to 3,000 times changes on erodibilities. It can impact a lot of the channel width and channel geometries and profiles. Fracture is important not only just for the surface processes, but also for the formation of subsurface. So formation of critical zone. Critical zone is a near surface environment that that top from the tree top canopies to the bottom of permeable bedrock. Critical zone is the near surface environment that a lot of rocks and water and soil and living organism are act together to supply a nutrient to the um, living organism and life. Um, the factors provide a pathway for water and life to get into the subsurface. And Bedrock fractures are likely controlled to, to the uh, uh, permeable bedrock and the deeper earth, and it will likely to influence the, influence the bottom extent of the critical zone. 
a nice review by Cliff Vibby at our 2017 paper summarized the varying controls on critical zone architecture. Critical zone processes including frost cracking, bedrock drainages of groundwater, reactive transport, and subcritical crackings and topographic stresses. All these processes will contribute to changes of fracture densities of within the critical zone with the bedrock became saprolite and weathered bedrock and saprolite and soil. So they will contribute to the increasing fracture density toward the surface and chemical losses uh, toward the surface and also the changes of physical property shown here as P wave velocities. All, all frost, uh, frost cracking and all of other uh, bedrock drainages and reactive transport and critical Crack, uh, crack, crack, subcritical cracking and topographic stress can influence in these processes. Recent studies trying to understand near surface stress controls on uh, fractures. So people have studied that near surface stress field can control the generation or act, um, growth of micro cracks and also the macroscopic fractures, which can have implications of long-term erosion and landscape evolution. The uh, review study of Missy Ips and um, Kimini 2017 paper explained really nicely about subcritical cracking processes. And subcritical cracking processes is chemophysical processes acting on the crack tips. So you can see here in the crack tip, there is an increased intensity of stresses we can, which can weaken the molecular bond strengths, and it induces the reaction between the water and the, and the rock. And we, this weakened bond will allow to propagate the cracks to uh, grow. And these crack tip processes, critical, uh, subcritical cracking, will be affected by both external stresses. The source of external stresses can be thermal stresses, tectonic stresses, or uh, topographic stresses, and it can also be affected by external factors affecting the chemical reactions, like uh, water content or acidities or the vapor pressures. And uh, another studies um, from uh, ETH group, Sam, Samuel Rose and uh, Kerry Lee's studies have shown exhumation induced stress um, can be also important. So in, in their work, they, they simulated for the transition from the V-shaped valley to a U-shaped valley on the mature Switzerland, uh, mature, mature valley on Switzerland, and they show that the bedrock exhumation related to the glacier erosion and the glacier glaciation loading and unloading histories and tectonics, and the long-term rock strengths affected by the specific uh, material properties in this rock can contribute to the rock damages on this landscape. And they use uh, two dimensional elastoplastic finite different models, simulated the, simulated the stress field considering the stress histories. And here's the, uh, one of the results that in their settings shown that the tensile fractures can, uh, can generate it on the shoulders of glacial valleys and uh, Fracture propagations here as exfoliation fractures can occur on this valley side and micro crack can occur on the bottom. Uh, different from these studies that examine the micro cracking or exhumation induced landslide, today I'm focusing on the topographic stress. So topographic stress is near surface stress field that is affected by the topography the mass or geometry of topography can influence the subsurface elastic stress field. So here's uh, this topographic stress um, idea has proposed by theoretical studies in 1980s from Savage et al. and Savage Swope paper. So they, they, they propose that topography can perturb gravitational and tectonic stress field in the subsurface. So here I'm showing the analytical solution for this bowl shaped ridges. The topography is shown as a gray color. And the bottom, I'm showing the two uh, principal stress orientations and magnitude in these lines. So the length of the line, it represents the magnitude and the orientation of uh, precipitation uh, 
orientation of st principal stresses are shown in these lines as well. So first, what you, you can see is, is when you go steeper due to the overburden, the stresses increases, especially the vertical stress increases. And what they show is due to the presence of this topography, this bowl shape, the magnitude and orientation of subsurface stress field changes. So here you can see that the horizontal magnitude of stresses are reduced under ridges compared to the side of the valleys. And also you can see at depths that the principal stresses orientation is pointing toward the ridges because of the loading from these ridges. So this solution, uh, the solution is considering for the, both of the gravity and the horizontal stress magnitude, assuming the same, uh, same magnitude of um, loading from the topographic relief of ridges. So Rowley's density, G's gravitational stress, and the relief of these ridges. This stress subsurface stress patterns will change depending on the topographic shape and also the ambient stress conditions come from gravity and tectonics. So later study of ours, um, we showed that the subsurface stress field can change depending on the tectonic stress magnitude. And due to the changes of stress, the, the areas of open fracture zone can also change. So here we generated a phase diagram showing on x-axis is sigma star. Sigma star is a non-dimensional quantity that um, topographic uh, the tectonic stress on the surf near the surface divided by the gravitational stresses shown here as a rho g l is the length between valley bottom and the ridge tops. So the relative this sigma star representing the relative magnitude of tectonic stress compared to the gravitational stress. And the y-axis shows the characteristic slope of the topography. So here shown as relief divided by the length of the topography. So this is characteristic slope. And what we did is we examined the, um, this ridges and valley topography and with this particular uh, slope, 0 0.2 slope shown in here, 0 0.4 slope here, and uh, simul uh, calculated the subsurface stress field and demarcate the open fracture zone using two proxies. So this red, red line is a contour of least compressive stress magnitude, same with 0 0.5 MPA. And the blue line shows the contour representing the fa failure potential value of 0 0.75. The magnitude of least compressive stress <clears throat> can be served as proxy for opening mode fractures and failure potential is calculated as differential stress divided by the sum of the stress. So it will representing the shear fracture potentials. And the area above the a higher failure potential than 0 0.75 and this compressive stress magnitude less than 0 0.5 will represent as the zone with open fractures. So with this exercise, what we found is the zone with open fracture changed significantly depending on sigma star value. So increasing tectonic magnitude can change the open fracture zone in the subsurface. Where the sigma star value is less than one, then gravity is dominating, then there is not much change between the below the ridges or below the valleys. So the open fracture zone or feather zone will be similar in from the surface. So it shows a surface parallel other zone in the landscape. However, if the tectonic stress increases and <clears throat> it, ha it has a larger perturbations associated with tectonic stress, then we, we see that under the ridges, there are deeper weather zone and in the valleys, there are thinner weather zone. So it will generate the surface mirroring zone with the weather, uh, weather zone. So you can have uh, so-called bow tie patterns on, on the landscape. To test this idea, uh, St. Clair and Moon et al. 2015 paper, we selected three sites. Based on the ambient stress measurement from nearby site, we constrained the stress tectonic magnitude and then calculated the sigma star values. And these three sites covers the low, low values of sigma star to high values of sigma star value. 
So here's our three sites shown here. Our first site is Golden Hill to Colorado based on the me measured um, uh, stress magnitude on nearby site is the sigma star value will be around 0 0.2 and South Carolina Piedmont site, um, which is Calhoun critical zone observatories, they have maximum horizontal stress value of four to six MPA. And it um, shown the magnitude and orientation shown in this arrows here. Palm Branch site is also have high magnitude, especially on the northeast orientations. For these three sites, we did 3D topographic stress calculations and uh, James and Claire and Steve Oldbrook's group from University of Wyoming conducted geophysical survey shown in here, the P-wave survey, a P-wave seismic sur survey line shown here as a black lines. Then we compare those two results together. So for 3D topographic stress calculation, I use boundary element model called Poly3D. So Poly3D is developed from uh, Stanford um, groups and it, it originally used for calculating the subsurface stress field perturbation associated with discontinuity on the fault. However, we use this Poly3D method to calculate the stress perturbation associated with the Earth's topography by assuming the Earth's topography is a geotraction boundary condition. So here I'm showing an example of MASH that I uh, do for the Golden Gulch site. And this surface in, will be used as uh, boundary elements. And we consider the ambient stress conditions by considering the stress magnitude and stress um, and I uh, differences of anisotropy from the measure, in situ measurement on nearby site, which will result from both the influence of tectonics and gravity will contribute to the ambient stress field. And the topopoly 3D will calculate the stress field perturbation associated with this traction free boundary within the linear elastic homogeneous isotropic uh, bed, uh, rock considering the ambient stress conditions. So our total stress is a sum of ambient stress come from tectonic and gravity and the topographic perturbation associated with the real 3D actual topography. From this model, we can calculate the 3D topographic stress field. We will quantify the principal stresses. And from the principal stresses, we quantified two different proxy. First one is failure potential, representing the shear of uh, fractures, the differential stress divided by the sum, and the magnitude of least compressive stress is used for proxy for uh, opening mode fractures. So here's our um, predictions from the stress model. So the modeled failure potential and modeled least compressive stress. As predicted from the phase diagram, the lower golden gulch site with lower sigma star value tend to have surface parallel predictions of open fracture zone. On the East Coast site, the South Carolina, Piedmont, and Palm Branch site, we expect, as expected, we see a bow tie patterns or surface bearing patterns of, of the uh, weather zone. So under the ridges, they can have a deeper weather zone and near the valleys, they have thinner weather zone. These predicted um, fracture patterns show a very good correspondence with measured P-wave velocity. So P-wave velocity was slower, shown in red color here, for those areas that we predict to have more open fractures. Here, Golden Gulch shows similar surface peril in, in the South Carolina and Pan Branch site, the, the seismic velocities are slower under the ridges and it's, just, it's, you know, it's deeper under the ridges and it's faster near the valleys. Not only just first order surface pedal and surface bearing patterns, the second order features are also similar. You can see that they're sloping down in this seismic velocities and it also matches with the predictions of uh, the open fractures as well. And here also coming up and this location is also deeper and comes up. And these slower velocity, uh, later studies of steep hole group had a deep bore hole, 65 meter deep bore hole on the South Carolina Piedmont site. And they found that the, the sonic velocity from the bore holes, the slower velocity matches really well with 
the uh, calculated uh, measured yellow hue from the fracture bowl images. So these yellow colors on the fracture images likely representing the weathered um, weathering of the bedrock. And you can see the fracture along the fractures, you see more yellow colors representing the intense weathering in the fractures. And that this reduction of seismic velocity matches well with the fracture abundances and also the weathering, intense weathering around the fractures as well. Although we do find some interesting correspondence between topographic stress and the potential bedrock fractures and uh, seismic velocity, there are still outstanding questions. First is, is near surface stress field induced differences in the abundances of open fractures? Is this open fracture or the weathering of these fractures are indeed come from the stress field variations? Or if this tectonic stress is influencing fracturing and weathering significantly, are there any observable consequences in the surface processes? To, te to test these two questions, we, uh, I, we conducted for the two studies. First study, we select a site that has an extensive data set from the subsurface and surface condition, and examine directly for the connections between stress and bedrock fracture distribution. And the second site, we search for the consequences of surface processes in the landscape. In this case, was bedrock landslide. So first, we select a force mark site in Sweden because this is a proposed permanent underground repository for nuclear waste. This area is deglaciated on the low relief landscape and has a Precambrian crystalline rocks. And there are detailed studies on surface and subsurface condition from the uh, Swedish nuclear fuel and waste management company to build this uh, deep repository site. This, the extensive uh, data include first, extensive in situ stress measurement from the overcoring and hydrofracturing data. They have 380 stress measurement around this uh, location. The, this is the force mark in the Sweden location, and this is our study area shown in here. And the black line is um, the coastlines, and uh, this is our study site. The study site shown as a dash box in here. Within this area, there was 380 stress measurement. And also they have 21 cord boreholes. And total cord boreholes include, the length is 15 kilometers. And these black dots and the um, gray dots are showing the location of boreholes projected on the surface. So they, not only they have a vertical boreholes, they also has inclined boreholes, which was able to capture in the uh, vertically oriented fractures as well. And they cover the larger spatial extent as well. And these boreholes, in many cases, reach to a kilometer, maximum depth of kilometers at best. And many of these boreholes have Televir survey of Televir survey, and total Televir surveys include seven kilometers of the borehole walls. And they have measurement for strike and deep and aperture of fractures and whether these fractures are mineralized or not. And also they have core observation documentations representing whether the fractures are open or not. And here's the image that, uh, photo there to uh, this. Taylor took when we visited together on the core facilities. So you can see these, this is core the borehole from the Sweden site. And there are a lot of um, fractures, but many of those fractures are actually closed. You can see some fractures here, but it's closed. But some of the fractures are open. And in their observations, they documented that the open fracture as if the fracture is visible on the bowl images and also discernible apertures from the core observations they define as open fractures. So here's one of the examples of open fractures. They have apertures and also shown some evidence of slip and, sub, slip and side a little bit in this one. For in total, they have 73,000 fractures and among 73,000, 20,000 fractures are open fractures. And these fractures show a good, um, somewhat correspondence to the fractures that we see on the surface. And uh, Brad Goodfellow is working on the surface fractures in this uh, force mark site and those studies are coming uh, soon. 
And let's see the measured stress, in situ stress measurement from uh, this force mark site. And here is the most compressive horizontal stress magnitude and least compressive horizontal magnitude stresses. Uh, and this includes both of the overcoring data and hydrofracturing data. And overcoring data tend to have a larger uh, scatters. But it is both of most compressive and least compressive stress indicate is evident that there are higher, more compressive, higher horizontal stresses. So you can see there the magnitude reached to almost 20 megapascal in the other surface. The source of this high compressive stress is slightly unknown. And this is, this, this is consistent to the overall thrust fault region on the northwest to southeast maximum horizontal compression in the regional area. But also, it is possible this high compression is related to the Pliocene ice sheet loading and unloading histories. Although we don't know the source of this high compressive stress, the ambient stress condition in present day stresses are measured to be highly compressive. And uh, here's our model setup for present day, uh, using the present day surface and subsurface conditions. So boundary element model on the surface is constructed using the topography and bathymetry of this area and ambient stress condition was constrained by in situ stress measurement. So the northwest corner has a strong compression, which is 19 to 11 MPA. On the northeast, uh, southwest is a strong compression, and northeast has weak compression. And we model those two locations uh, separately because they have a different ambient stress condition. And we also consider the loading from the sediment and seawater and pore pressure effect from the seawater as well. And we model the air. Um, Large, uh, around four kilometer by four kilometer area with depth to the 600 meter, um, the sur uh, sub 600 meter below the surface. So first, let's look at the um, observations. So this shows the abundances of fracture from those borehole. First panel shows fractures in all deeps. Second panel shows fractures on the sub horizontal, so deeps are, deep angles are less than 20 degrees. And the third panel shows slightly um, steeply deeping fractures that is greater than uh, 20 degrees. And as you can see on the fracture abundances are lower at depths and generally increase toward the surface. There are deformation zones at deeper depths which indicated a little higher uh, fracture abundances, but generally near surface that the fracture abundances increase toward the surface. And to test whether these fractures are affected by the present day stress field, what we did is we quantified the normal stress acting on this fracture plane and also shear stress acting on this plane from the 3D stress field. And using this measured uh, uh, calculated stress field, we quantified two proxies. One is to represent the prox uh, proxy for opening mode failure, which is calculated as one minus normal stress divided by most compressive stress. And if it is close to one, then fracture is likely oriented to the most compressive stress. So it's the opening mode fracture is, is not likely to occur. But if the fracture is oriented to the least compressive stress, then fracture will have higher tendency of opening mode failures. And the second panel calculated, we calculate the shear stress divided, uh, shear traction divided by the normal traction. And this will represent as the shear failure uh, proxies. And the blue color shows the probability density distribution of these proxies for sealed fractures. And red color showing the probability distribution come from open, actual open fractures. And as you can see, what we see is open fractures tend to have higher, um, more abundant, associated with the more abundant values of higher values of, of opening mode failures and shear failure proxies. So fractures are likely to be more open where present day stress field favors either opening mode or shear fractures. To examine this more in detail, what we did is we plot on x-axis shear failure 
um, proxies and y-axis on opening mode failures. And higher values of opening mode and shear failure proxies representing the likelihood have, to have these fractures. And the color representing the abundances of fractures that in that each uh, beams. So the color has this one shows low abundance, blue is low abundance, and the red is high abundance. And we plot this for, examine this for all fractures and of all fracture abundances, open fracture abundances, and relative abundances of open and all fractures. Interestingly, that for all fracture abundances and all open fracture abundances doesn't show a good correspondence with predicted uh, opening mode and shear, shear failures. So even though the opening mode failure value is high, the abundance of all fractures and open fractures are low. And increased shear failure proxies, they tend to have slightly more abundances, but generally the larger abundances are not occurring for those locations where pre present day stress predict to have open mode or shear failure, uh, shear failures. However, when we look at the relative abundance of open fracture compared to all fractures, it means the fraction of open fractures show a good correspondence. For, for example, here, where the opening mode failure are predicted, we see uh, around like above the 60% of those fractures are likely to be open in that case. And also the shear factors uh, will be um, higher, relative abundance was higher with increasing shear failure mode as well. This indicates that the all abundances of all fractures and open fractures are not likely affected by present day stress field. It's likely come from the prior deformations or lithologic heterogeneity. However, the present day stress field may influence its relative opening of those existing fractures. So we examine this and see how those relations change with um, depths. So here on X axis showing the opening mode failures, Y axis show the shear, uh, the X axis here, the second plot shows the shear failures and Y axis shows the elevation. So at a given depth shown here is upper zero to 100 meter where the both failure mode, uh, opening mode failure and shear failure is predicted tend to have higher um, op relative openness of those fractures. So the color in this case represent the open fracture divided by the all fractures. And this influence of higher potential of fracture opening actually indeed induces higher relative opening is persistent from the near surface to approximately depths of 500 meter. So this we also plot that each beams of this colored beam are plotted as a scattered plot. So you can see on the uh, x-axis is still fracture proxies and y-axis is open fracture divided by all um, fractures, relative opening. And relative opening is increasing with the increasing predictions of opening mode or shear failures for those um, fra the, uh, fractures. Our work um, indicates that it's likely that the population of existing fractures, the abundances of fractures are reflecting the prior deformation or geologic heterogeneity. However, the present day stress field influences the relative abundance of open fractures that goes from the near surface and also goes to 100 meter of the depths. This indicates that the present day stress field may contribute to formation of deep critical zone, which is much deeper than previous studies have typically examined. Our work uh, uh, also suggests that maybe the deep critical zone is not a distinctive layer, but is more like, like a diffuse layer where the permeability changes with depth as a function of bedrock stress field. And a second question that we asked was, okay, 3D topographic stress may highlight the zone with more damaged rock in the landscape, shown in here as a blue color, and to have a deep weather zone under the ridges and the valleys may have shallow weather zone. And these patterns of subsurface weather zone will change depending on the 3D topographic shape, uh, shapes and also the stress condition. Do we see observable consequences of this topographically induced bedrock 
fractures and weathering on the surface processes. One of the potential that can impact it by bedrock fracture is bedrock landslide. And previous studies of Clark and Burbank shows that there are, they examine the two locations on New Zealand. One is Fiordland and uh, the other one is South Southern Alps. And Fiordland, they, um, in these two sites, they use the seismic velocity profiles and characterize fracture patterns. In Fiordland, they tend to have higher fractures on the surface and low fractures at depths. And in this case, they have two steps on the seismic, seismic velocity profiles, and they tend to have shallow landslide. However, in the Southern Alps, they, tend, they did see a deep fracture zone, more or less uniform seismic velocity profiles at depths. In this case, landslide, uh, they found that they, it could lead to a deep landslide because the fracture distribution are um, affected by tectonic fracturing. So it says it can go deeper. This work shows the potential connections between bedrock fractures and lands, landslide size. They examined the two different locations. However, uh, they didn't uh, examine this, how these individual landslides are affected by the spatial patterns of uh, uh, bedrock fractures and weathering patterns which leads to our hypothesis. So we propose that topographic stress may influence the bedrock landslide size by modulating the surface pa spatial patterns of subsurface open fractures and weathering. So in this case, if the open fracture zone is predicted to be shallow, which may lead to a small landslide, but if a location has open fracture zone is much goes deeper, then we may actually see a larger landslide. And this work is doing, uh, done by my former postdoc, Ken and I uh, work on this uh, paper and our paper is published last month in Nature Geoscience. So if you're interested in uh, check our papers. So to test this idea, what we did is we examined the connections between topographic stress and bedrock landslide in Eastern Tibet. We choose Eastern Tibet site. We choose this um, 20 kilometer by 25 kilometer areas in shown in yellow box here within um, the Longwenshan region. Because we choose this site because it has within a one tectonic block and has uniform rock type granitic rocks. And also this site has abundant landslide from 2008 Wenchuan earthquake induced landslide. And they also had abundant landslide previous to 2008, likely due to the precipitation induced landslide. And also they have um, five boreholes within the same tectonic blocks shown in here on uh, white colors. And uh, they have 23 hydrofracturing measurement in this site. So the orientation of the most compressive vertical stresses are shown in here. They are consistent to northwest to southeast directions. And here's the results that um, the compiled in situ stress measurement in this location, even though they're um, the value, uh, they are collected from slightly different mythologies, granite and non granitic rocks, and sometimes they collect before and after the earthquake. They do show a pretty consistent um, trend with the depth profiles of horizontal uh, compressive stresses. So here's the most compressive horizontal stresses and least compressive horizontal stresses. Using this red line um, on the best fit line, we um, use the ambient stress conditions from here. So combining this ambient stress field likely come from tectonics and gravity, combined with the 3D topography of this landscape, we calculate the uh, 3D topographic stress. And here's our result showing the failure potential at 500 meter depths below the surface. So the higher failure potential shown in here in blue color 0 0.7 will likely represent the area with the deep open deep open fracture zone and the yellow color or greenish color will show the shallow open fracture zone so we show uh, this spatial distribution of failure potential uh, used at uh, calculated for 500 meter depths 500 meter depth is actually quite deep, but because the highest resolution of DEM without an artifact in this area is 90 meter, and also to, to model the extensive areas, we couldn't have a really high 
resolution. We, we don't have first, we don't have high resolution TEN, and also to cover this area, our mesh size was around 300 meter. That's why we calculated on the 500 meter below the surface. But this, even though it's deep, it still captured the kilometer different scale differences of valley affected by the channel valleys and relief of the mountains affecting the subsurface the potential distribution of the open fracture zone. And, and we mapped um, earthquake and precipitation induced landslide from uh, these locations and the blue represent precipitation induced landslide and red represent earthquake induced landslide. And that color scheme will be the same for the rest of the talk. So you can see the precipitation induced landslide occurred along this ridges mostly, but they also distributed uh, slightly. But the earthquake induced landslide is distributed uh, most of our uh, areas. And we mapped scar and deposit areas separately uh, using the high resolution satellite images. And for each of this individual landslide, we calculated the maximum value of failure potential um, associated with this each landslide. And here's our um, result. So first, x-axis shows the maximum failure potential for that landslide, and y-axis show the scar, landslide scar area in low scale. And each of these gray dots are landslides. So for earthquake-induced landslide, we have 861 landslide. Precipitation-induced landslide, we have 121 landslide. We can see that the failure, maximum failure potential increases. This is representing the deep open fracture zone. So there are weak positive correlation between the extent of open fracture zone and the bedrock landslide size. But correlation is not too strong. And if you look at the median size, median is shown with this colored box and the um, error bar showing 45 and 50 percentiles. The median size doesn't change much when you over while the maximum failure potential vary from 0 0.2 to 0 0.7, the median size doesn't change much for earthquake induced landslide. Precipitation induced landslides change slightly, but it's not much of variation can be explained by uh, maximum failure potential. However, when we look at the upper extent of landslide size, here we quantify as 95 percentiles of scar area, we show a very good correlation. So in here, you can see the larger landslide size are showing a good correlation with the predicted um, values, predicted patterns of shallow to deep open fracture zone. So the areas with deeper open fracture zone tend to accommodate larger bedrock landslide. And it's shown for the earthquake induced landslide and also is shown for the precipitation induced landslide as well. And interestingly, if you put plot them together, these trends are overlapping each other, which may indicate that this open fracture zone controls on the size of landslide may be independent from the triggering mechanisms. We also examined whether other controls can explain this larger or upper extent. So we, we examined um, 11 different uh, variables, including topographic variables and seismic shaking proxies and precipitation related proxies. But none of these proxies can explain uh, the upper extent of landslide size. So stress proxies explain better than other uh, variables. Although we found some interesting uh, differences that we also calculate the landslide aerial uh, aerial density, so basically abundances of landslide and how much of landslides are within a two kilometer by two kilometer area. In this case, failure potential doesn't explain abundances of landslide, but the gradient and the PGA, peak ground uh, acceleration, explain better for those abundances of landslide, aerial density of um, the landslide, which is consistent with previous work that a lot of landslide induced uh, earthquake induced landslide tend to occur with locations with steep slopes and uh, strong shakings. However, what we show is the size of the bigger landslide can explain better with the topographic stress. And precipitation induced slide, both failure potential and elevation, produce a good correlation with aerial densities. 
that there are some cool variation is um, sh shown and it is predicted because topographic stress is influenced by topography. So there are some cool variation between the topographic measures and the topographic uh, stress proxies. So to examine those cool variation, what we did is we uh, plot the maximum gradient one of the uh, topographic metrics with the maximum failure potential. And they indeed show a good uh, positive correlation. And the symbol of these dots are, now we show the size of landslide as the size of symbols. So the black line is predicted linear fit between these covariant co um, controls. And what we found is the larger landslide shown in here as colored line, colored thin line is larger than 40,000 uh, 40, meters square and thick uh, lines are representing 100,000 meters square a landslide larger than 100,000 meter. Those larger landslides tend to occur where the failure potential is greater and at a given maximum gradient. You can see this is the same maximum gradient, but the larger land, there are more larger landslides tend to occur where the maximum value potential is greater, which is shown in here as well in the precipitation of this landslide. Larger ones tend to occur on the maximum value, higher maximum value potential. This is indicating that topographic stress controls on landslide size is evident in the wide ranges of covariant controls. So uh, Pierre van der Beek uh, wrote a nice uh, news and views article of our uh, paper. Um, he has a nice summary of our work. The near surface stress patterns influenced by topography controls the size and location of largest landslide, but not necessarily on the small landslide. This correspondence is likely due to the influence of topographic stress induced fracturing and its influence on the material strengths or the groundwater flow and uh, the rate. Our work implies that the extent of hill slope failure is depend on not only the local topography, but can also affect it by the distant tectonic forces, which has implications for hazard mitigations and landscape evolution. Although we, many of, um, some of our work shows good correspondence with topographic stress and um, bedrock landslide and uh, P wave velocities and bedrock fractures, it's likely uh, that our model um, is wrong. And based on, for based on the famous quote from a statistician uh, box says, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And to, to be, um, our stress model is based on simple material properties, like assumed homogeneous, isotropic and linear elastic material properties, which is very rare in the reality. And it doesn't take into account all factors in reality as well. We don't uh, consider the stress histories or the inelastic material properties, in different mythologies and better composition. However, this simple elastic model is easily generalizable and also easily applicable to different locations. And it can provide a useful predictions for bedrock fractures and near surface processes in the landscape. And this simple elastic model will give us a prediction that we can test in real landscape. And so one, one of the, uh, the important part that the model didn't take into account is the uh, material properties. So previous, a lot of our previous work on topographic stress is based on crystalline rock. However, this is uh, the photo that I um, borrowed from EGU blog. And this photo shows the, uh, the two different rocks here on the strong quartz metal conglomerate and uh, the weak phyllite. And the metal conglomerate has a lot of uh, the symmetric fractures, brittle fractures, but in the phyllite, they don't have brittle fractures. All the fractures are um, either micro cracks or is dis distributed to in the ductile, uh, deform in the ductile ways. So we don't know how the different mythology influence or influence by the topographic stress in the field is largely uh, unknown. And there are studies are 
of recent studies that showing the laboratory experiments and the field sites to better understand the inelastic constitutive relationship considering the subcritical damages. Uh, works from Simon Rowe and Carrie Lees and Missy Ives. And I'm excited to hear about Anne's research in next um, coming uh, landscape live about her work as well. And elastic model doesn't take into account these variations. Uh, but some, we found some interesting um, different patterns when we examined the different uh, mythologies. So here, this is this work I collaborate with the Sue Brantley and Andy uh, Nyblade on uh, Shale Hill CGO team. So Shale Hill site is very close to Pond Branch site. Pond Branch site has a strong tectonic compressions. So this location if the tectonic stress is highly compressive, we expect to see a good correspondence between P-wave velocity and predictions from strong compressions. However, we found a better correspondence with low horizontal compressions and not in the high compression, compressional scenarios. This may due to the mechanically weak shales that may not hold the strong uh, compressive stress that may, may lead to a better correspondence with the weak horizontal compressive stress. Also, this could be uh, locally low horizontal compressions in this local site as well. In, the, in this case, um, they show that the, the variation seismic velocities are explained better with the reactive uh, water pa flow pass and chloride weatherings. So a lot of work uh, on the critical zone has benefited from the previous studies on the critical zone observatories that extensively examine what's going on on the subsurface. And for um, the new critical zone collaborative network leading by Steve Holbrook and Cliff, we are trying to examine the site across the varying bedrock compositions, varying tectonic stresses and environmental conditions. And we try to compare with the different method of near surface geophysics, geochemistry and hydrology. So which will help, uh, we are hoping to learn more about the deeper critical zone processes with this um, effort. Another important thing that we found is the importance of hydrology. So this is a model showing the least compressive stress distribution on the force mark site. So this is the transect shown in the Sweden site and vary from here around four kilometer areas. And uh, in the upper part, they, near the surface, they show some variations. This only take into account bedrock surface. But if you take into account bedrock surface and sediment and water, actually the water pore pressure changes the stress distribution a lot. And it also changes the stress proxies on the, especially the shear proxies. And what we found is that the exploratory power of model proxy for observed fracture openness is improved if we take into account the water pore pressure which may indicate the importance of hydrology uh, in this case. So for the future studies, we're trying to examine the influence of stress histories and variabilities on this um, observed fracture abundances and openness on the surface processes as well. And we, want, we would like to include the glacier-induced stress histories and uh, pore pressure development in the subsurface related to glacier uh, histories. And the Sweden project is in collaboration with uh, Diego Masipas from uh, SKD and also Taylor and Stephen Brett as well. And I also have a project to better understand the hydrology connections with the stress and its impact on the landslide with uh, Giuseppe and Dino and uh, Ricardo and Bill and Ryan to, in a uh, US site as well. So today I'll present the work um, to better understand the topographic stress influence on, um, on the surface. And we found, we showed that near surface stress field affected by subsurface bedrock stress, topography and pore pressure may influence the fracture openness at deep depths and prepare the rock for a further subaerial weathering and produce uh, observable consequences in the landscape as well. So shown on the Sweden study, we show the relative openness of fractures likely to be affected by a present day stress field. And the size of bedrock landslide may be affected by the uh, topographic stress um, predictions on the open fracture zone. And combining the model predictions and extensive data set from the surface and subsurface will enhance our understandings of interaction between the subsurface stress, surface topography, and near surface processes. 
So I'd like to thank my um, UCLA groups, my students, and especially again did uh, hard work on the Eastern Tibet and also my collaborators on the Sweden project and um, the collaborators from uh, CZ Observatory and Collaborative Network. But, uh, thanks for uh, listening to my talk. Yeah, thank you very much for this really nice talk, Sergi. So um, to everybody, we have opened the chat now, so you can post your questions within the chat. Or if you'd like to prefer to just ask your question in live, you can also use your microphone. Um, but in order to unmute yourself, um, we need to allow you to do this. So please use the little hand symbol to raise your hand and uh, we can give you permission. Okay, so while people are probably writing up their questions, I might just start by myself. Start myself. And I was wondering most during your whole talk about the role of material properties or lithology. And, and you kind, kind of touched on this already towards the end, saying there's a lot of unknowns still in there. But can you just say something? What, what is your feeling? Do you think material properties will just introduce some scatter in this nice trend that you see um, between the landslide size and, and, uh, and stress? Or do you think it can substantially shift the whole relationship? So kind of what is the first order, second order control? That's a uh, that's excellent questions. And um, that's why a lot of my studies are focused on granite rocks or <laughs> on the crystalline rocks, which we try to minimize some of the uh, influences coming from the material property differences. But I agree uh, with you that um, we, the shale hill site examples show a very different trend, which may indicate that the inelastic, if the rock is really subject to the inelastic um, you know, failures, inelastic deformations, then we may actually see a very different trend. And Kerry this did a lot of uh, work on better understanding, implementing the inelastic material properties on um, Matter Valley Swizen site and he showed that um, that can be important especially for if the rocks are um, subject to the inelastic deformation but for the rock if the rock is behaving on the elastic way then i think the topographic stress can provide some predictions of whether those fractures will be open or closed or you know what the predicted patterns on the relative opening of those fractures great thanks a lot I actually see that there are two people who raised their hand, and I didn't see who was first. I think so Jess I will... was first, um, oh, okay. so we can go ahead and let him ask his question. Yep. So Jesse, you should be able to unmute yourself. I am a muted, yes. Excellent, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Shilji, for your talk. Um, you know, very interesting. And, you know, I'm sure we can talk all day about uh, the theory of, you know, stress strain and uh, fractures, but uh, my question now is more practical, and um, I'd like to talk about resolution of of the modeling and uh, and how this could be uh, kind of increased. So I, I hope you can answer this question. I don't know if you can, uh, but um, I'm wondering, you know, in 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 this model of um, the last kind of bit of work that you showed, um, you know, with the landslides, um, I think it was a few hundred square kilometers. Uh, how many kind of core days uh, did that take? So I, I'm saying core days, like, you know, if you, if your computer has four cores, you know, it may take a hundred days, but if you have a hundred cores, uh, you know, it will only take four days, that kind of thing. So did you did you use just a, a normal computer? Or did you, what kind of computer, computational resources did you use? So uh, the calculation that I did use the Poly 3D, um, which um, can run on the workstation. So we do have 32 cores with 32 um, gigabyte memories, and it took a couple days to run the models. But the key point, the resolution issues on the Eastern T Tibet site is the resolution of DEM itself is 100 meter, close to 100 meter. So in other sites, my critical zone work, they do have a lighter data that we can go over much higher resolutions. But I think it depending on the resolution is chosen depending on our interest. In the Eastern Tibet uh, studies, we are not interested in the single landslide with really, you know, 
different topographic form. We are rather interested in the landscape size, you know, landscape landscape scales, basically a huge mountains, and how does that vary due to the changes of the uh, the relief of the mountains and the valley spacings, and that, that's why we kind of um, sacrifice to have slightly larger resolution. 300 meter, but capturing those kilometer scale variations on the mountainous scales to capture the differences and the variations. So the, those variations can change depending on your interest. And of course, if you have uh, infinite number of cores, you can run a really high resolution. But the key part on the Eastern Tibet is we need a higher resolution DEM if you want to do a higher resolution uh, stress calculation. But also stress perturbation scale with the scales of the topography variation. If we are in, because we are interested in the mountain scale, we can capture those scales using a slightly poor resolution in that case. Yeah, yeah so it makes sense. Definitely, yeah, there's definitely room for improvement in the future. So. <laughs> yeah, the higher the relief you have, the, the lower resolution you need. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, I, I think I'm, as far as I'm aware, there, there's now global coverage of uh, it's called a 10 DM, 10 meter, mm -hmm. a 10 meter DM. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't I know if check, that was available back, back then. Yeah, I, I can check those ones. We, we checked the 30 meter DM, but there are a lot of artifacts in these steep landscapes. Mm -hmm. So we kind of choose to use a um, 90 yeah. meter one. But I, I agree that uh, there are recent ones that are coming, so we can check those ones as well. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so now we can uh, move on to our um, next person, uh, which is uh, N. If you want to ask your question, um, I will now, uh, I think you can now be able to unmute yourself. Hi. But I can't for some reason show my video, I'm very sorry. So thank you very much for this great talk, Sylvie. It was uh, great again to hear about it. Um, I have one question because you have referenced um, some of your work with the work Kerry Lee did, and mm -hmm. he always plots the differential stress. What mm -hmm. made you choose not to plot the differential stress, but the least compressive stress? So uh, we we did. So what we, what we did on the least um, compressive stress is basically when we do the science paper in 2015, the better correlation we found on the least compressive stress, um, the failure potential include the differential stress. Failure potential is differential stress divided by the uh, um, sum of the stress. So maximum shear divided by the mean stress that include the differential stress. But for the seismic velocity, we find a better correlation with the least compressive stress. And that's why we eventually choose the least compressive stress. And maybe the fracture open, I don't, I'm, I'm completely speculating, but maybe some of the opening of fractures may be affected by what's the least amount of stress they need to be overcome. That's one of the rationale that we put the least compressive stress magnitude in one of our proxies there, yeah. No, I, think I, I, I would completely agree that actually with the uh, the p wave velocity will be much more affected by the least compressive stress than the differential stress. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, yeah, just wanted to clarify why you did it. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Anna. Then we move over to the chat. And the first question is by Luca Malatesta, who first thanks you for the nice talk and asks if you could say a few words about the healing of fractures. So can mineralization of the veins end up strengthening, strengthening the rocks again, um, or at least countering the initial weakening, or is it all a one-way road towards weakening? So kind of think about limestone fractures that get healed by calcite veins. It's a, a great question. And Luca just introduced that um, what we're trying to do on the next paper, <laughs> which is actually we're trying to examine how the stress impacting those, uh, the, especially the Sweden site, there are a lot of um, fractures with filled with the minerals. There are a lot of fractures already healed, already covered secondary minerals, either they have calcite or um, and different minerals. They have different stages of minerals. So what we're trying to do there is whether we do see some different uh, openness depending on those fractures. And we do find some different differences depending on if the fractures are filled up with uh, high uh, temperature minerals versus low temperature minerals. But it, 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 as, you, as you said, you know, it can be either way. It, it either healed, completely sealed and not fracturing at all, or it can um, 
present as a weaker plane because some of the minerals like a calcite or some of the minerals precipitated as a plane, planar, more planar minerals may act as easier locations to slide. So that will be depending on what is the secondary mineral was formed in each of the fractures. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to <clears throat> our next question from E. Valgas. How are horizontal stresses imposed in the boundary element model? Are they allowed to vary with, with depth? Yes, uh, so what we did is uh, the, the ambient stress take into account the constant value on the horizontal and it changed with depths. So we also take into account the magnitude on the surface and the gradient in depths. And the stress perturbation on the topography, when we calculate the tractions, we actually subtract the whole body uh, with the depths. So it, it is taking account both on the gradient and the surface magnitude for the ambient stress calculations. Yeah. The traction calculation on the boundary element take into account what's going on on the gradient at depths as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Then we move to the next question by Mikhail Atal. Um, and it again relates to the size of landslides. Um, he also thinks it was a great talk and asks, um, if you, um, well, what do you think about covariance of parameters as topographic stress will scale with relief? You showed the relationship between maximum failure potential and maximum gradient, but would it make sense also to compare with relief or hill slope length as the maximum size of a landslide may be controlled by these factors? That's a great question. And um, I actually have a, oops, let's see if I have a backup slide just in case. <laughs> Ask and uh, thanks for uh, asking the question. So here's our, uh, we did examine the uh, distance to channels and the length of the hill slope. And um, here's the maximum distance to channels. And as this is similar ones that I showed in the class uh, in the presentation of this maximum gradient here, but we also examine the maximum distance to channel. It, it, they, they do have co-variations, but again, the larger landslides tend to occur more at a given distance to channel, if the, uh, the failure potential predict to have a deeper weather zone, they tend to see a larger landslide. So this is one of, um, one of the bigger uh, that we put, put it in on the supplementary material. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so now we have a question from Ed Rhodes, who also said this, with, thanks you for the interesting talk. And he says that he's very interested in the time evolution of deep fractures. Do you have any ideas or information about this? This, this is a uh, very good question. And that, uh, these deep uh, fractures that we see on the Sweden uh, 600 meter depths, they, there are not just one time fractures. What they think is because the Sweden has pre-Cambrian pre rock. So there are, they, people who studied on the fracture evolution, they think there was a multiple stages of the fracture evolution, which goes to billion years to most recently to um, quaternary that may related to the, uh, the glacier um, period or glacier differences. So the really deep, deep uh, the old stages, they, they studied different stages by mineral assemblages and we, they, I don't think they, uh, they, some evidence that they go for um, billion or million years times, but I don't think this, they have characterized all of the factor with individual datings, but they have a pretty good um, ideas of five different stages encompassing from billion years to most recent recent times. So what we found is we are, we are not talking that generation of those fractures are related to present day stress, but what we found is the relative opening of those fractures, whether they are open or closed or percentages of open of those fractures are um, explained well with the present day stress field. Okay, thank you. Um, at the moment, there are no more questions in the chat and I don't see a raised hand. So I will just ask a last question myself and give people a few more seconds to actually post a question if they want to. And it's kind of pushing everything a bit more forward. So when we think about um, landscape 
processes or landscape shaping processes, grain size often plays an important role. Also like mm -hmm. the grain size that is produced in hill slopes and then transferred to the river. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering in those sites where you have measured your P-wave velocities and, and did your fracture analysis, have you looked at grain sizes that are produced on those hill slopes? <laughs> Do you see any kind of trend there as well? That is a, another excellent question. And uh, uh, right now I have a, a postdoc, Al Nili, who was a student of Roman DBRC. And if you remember last uh, landscape, a live talk, uh, Al was working a lot on the grain size. And that's exactly what we want to try to do on next few years that uh, Al is currently working on those sites that has a differences of P-wave velocities. And we're trying to understand how that impact the grain size distribution and changes. And whether, um, as you said, you know, the grain size became smaller and how does that impact on the river processes? So that's, I'm, I'm glad to hear your question. It means that we are in the right direction. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. I don't see any further questions. So I think we just finished the seminar here. I'd like to thank you again very much for this really nice talk. Yeah, and everybody else for joining us. And yeah, hope to see all of you again next week. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your time.